this exhibition is supported by the city of SLO, SLO Brew, Mar Farm, KSBY, and a very generous sponsorship by Carmel and Akasha Law Firm. So um, we can clap for them. <laughs> Uh, I shared last night in my remarks that this um, that I first personally first discovered Alyssa's work when I was a teenager, and so it feels very special that you know um, after so much time that this all these works are here in this space at this moment. I think it's a really special um, special show and special time, and um, we're so thrilled that Alyssa was able to be with us this weekend. Um, this is uh, I would say the largest spanning. Um, retrospective of Alyssa's work to date and the works in this show um, are, you know, from 2006 on. So there's um, a huge selection um, and we're grateful to Forum Gallery for helping facilitate all these many, many loans to have all of this work here. Um, this talk will be about 50 minutes. Um, I have some questions for Alyssa. She has lots to share, uh, but I wanna make sure that you all get your questions in too. We have to um, boogie pretty quick after the talk. So if you have burning questions, now's your chance because <laughs> we won't be lingering for too long after this hour. Um, so I'll go ahead and kick us off. So um, obviously this is the first time you've had a museum retrospective that has spanned your career. Um, I would love to hear just your reflections on the trajectory of your practice and how, um, how it's changed over the years. There's the work from 2006 is right there. Um, and then, yeah, I'd love to hear your reflections on that. I always feel like I should do karaoke when I'm holding a microphone. So if I break out in song, I'm not, I'm not in control. Um, I want to say thank you. I mean, this is this is so moving. I did not expect to, I don't know, feel so much in looking at all this work. I don't tend to look back very much. And um, when you see like the pictures of work, it's different than seeing the real things, right? Thank you to a Forum Gallery, to Nicola and, and Bob as well for making this possible and all the work you and the rest of the staff put in to gathering all this work up. It's not an easy task. And I feel like it's like my birthday or something. You know, it's amazing um, to be reunited with all of this. And yeah, to, to see these, this actually is a, a pretty good snippet of uh, a number of experiments that I was doing uh, with water. So. That is the first piece in the show. That's the oldest piece. It's called Skin. And I'm, I'm just so glad I get to see it again. It, it really was one of my favorites from um, that early, early period. This is 2006. And I had just started the water series. And, you know, it's true I did have this kind of attraction to water as a kid. I almost drowned like four times when I was a, a little kid. I was drawn to water and I would jump in and they'd lose me and whatever. I was, I am the youngest of eight kids. And um, I think there was some kind of quiet about the water that I liked. So there was some kind of like getting underwater was just quiet um, anyway. But I, I didn't really intentionally go towards water as a subject for any kind of symbolic meaning. It was more uh, an attraction to the technical challenge, really. And I got a lot of questions about that last night. It was like, how do you make these? How do you make these? And I always kind of want to rush past that because to me that's like, I don't know. It's not as exciting as the subject and like why of, you know, the how is one thing, but it's the why that I'm more fascinated with at this point, which when I was making them, I wasn't even aware of. It was all impulsive. It was like, what would happen if I did this? Now let's try this. And so that was the real beginning. I did a number of, of bathtub paintings that if you look through the book, you'll see them in the beginning. And it was um, from a place of, you know, is it possible to paint things underwater? And anyway, I look at this painting and I see, you know, myself in my 20s, I, I painted this in a row house apartment in Brooklyn with no heat and one electrical outlet. I would blow the fuse all the time. I was heating the place with my stove, my oven really, like just craziness. Um, and I was, I was so happy. <laughs> I was so happy painting and, and uh, 
I don't look that happy in the in the portrait, but I'm uh, I am because it, there was real power in being able to just make something up like that. And uh, you know the 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 big question last night was how much of these are based from photographs, and I will say that um, the photography has been a major part of my practice. It's not just take a picture and then copy it. I, I actually was trained as a photographer in college and worked in a dark room as much as I did in a painting studio and developed my own negatives and sandwiched them and did all the experimentation, burned my negatives, all that kind of Sally Man stuff. And, um, and then I would paint from black and white photos oftentimes. And uh, you know, once digital photography became uh, really accessible, which was right around the you know this time a little earlier, I was able to to use Photoshop and and get a lot more skilled at creating a, a reference. But as much time as I would take on the reference, the painting process was a whole other animal, you know, because you're editing the photo. You don't. I'm copying a photo is not interesting to me. I mean, I understand the wow, it looks just like a photo compliment. But it is not um, my goal to look like a photo. I don't see the point of that. I want to be better than the photo. I want to show you something you've never seen before. And I want you to see the paint. I want you to feel the paint. I want you to like feel my energy in those brush strokes, which changes over time. That's the tightest one in the show. And tight meaning, you know, all the lines are closed and, you know, um, I like to say Apollonian because it's very systematic and logical and not abstract. As compared to this, this is the last one, you know, that, that's one of the latest ones in the show. So you could see there's kind of a span. We're talking about more than a decade of work, right? 16 years, how many years? 16 years. So, and there's a lot of paintings in between these. You know, they think there's, between 250 and 300 paintings total out there. Um, but yeah, did I answer the question? I don't know what the question was. Great. <laughs> the question is just a departure. <laughs> okay. I, I'm very talky, so <laughs> that's what they're here for. Um, I would love to hear a little bit about your, uh, your process. So um, not technically, but your sort of inspiration and your starting point where you begin, and also how you know when you're finished. Well, um, you know, someone asked me last night, what inspires you? And, you know, sometimes I try to make up an answer to this. But the truth is, is I have no idea where it comes from. And I will tell you, I do not want to know because I don't want to mess with that. That is too important. I just get these um, ideas, these exciting, like, what ifs. You know, so it, it's, well, if, if vinyl can do that, then what happens if you go underwater? So the next piece is immersion. That was, that's an underwater picture. And I, I remember my brother telling me he had like a underwater housing for, for uh, his digital camera. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I took it and I took pictures underwater only to find out that the, the under surface creates this distorted lens, which I was like, oh my God. So to answer the question, I think what really excites me is the unexpected, is seeing something that I don't, don't expect to see, that it, that's surprising, that's engaging, that um, pushes your idea of what's real, you know? So I, I actually did a whole series of those underwater paintings as well. And, um, and then, yeah, like one thing leads to another. I think, is that the next one? I, this is what I want to get is the order. I had to put them in order. Um, no, this one here is behind me. So I quickly wanted to get away from the bathroom, even though I returned to the bathroom shortly after. But I did take a, <laughs> I did take a a little trip outside, um, which I didn't stay too long because really, I think in a house with eight kids, the bathroom is the only place where you have any privacy. So I went right back in. Um, but this was part of my uh, venturing out. And it was, again, it was like looking for places where you see the unexpected. So all of these little weird ripples, which honestly only a camera can capture. And 
and then to, to try and paint it in a way that you have to interpret it. Like you can't copy that and you wouldn't want to. It would probably break your brain to do it. It would break my brain. So to, to try to impro like improvise on it was was an interesting idea. I, I never think, oh my God, this is gonna be the best painting this world has ever seen. It's just kind of like a impulse, like, I wonder what that would look like. And then I have to do it. And I spend all the hours doing, just following this whim. And I get to the end and I'm like, oh, so that's what that looks like. Anyway, and I move on to the next whim. They're experiments, they're not, I, I feel like inspiration is like a train that if you don't get on it and stay on it, you're gonna you're gonna lose the momentum. You're gonna you're not gonna make it to the next stop. So whenever I get these little bursts of ideas, I have to do them, or else you know, I don't know. So like this one was um, I, this is called Vaseline too. I think this might be one of the next ones. Yeah. So that one it was like I wanted to paint skin, but I wanted to paint it in a way that it felt like paint. And I was just thinking, like, what feels like paint that I could put on skin? And I remember I was driving on the highway when I had the thought of Vaseline. And then it was like, my brain is just like, I can't think about anything else except Vaseline. And, like, the, the reason why I use myself so much is because it feels like an emergency. And there's no time to get a model sometimes. Like, it's like, don't let it go, you know. And, and so, yeah, get the Vaseline cover it in, in cover my whole self and in, in my hair which I do not recommend it really takes a long time to get out and then just start getting to work so there's a whole series of Vaseline paintings that I did and um and it's like yeah okay so that's fun now what else and and there you know so it's all it's all just kind of these these whims of like you know I had a pregnant friend at the time and this is called vapor now we're all the way up to 2008, so it's two years later from the beginning. And it seemed like the body itself could be a filter to look through. I don't know. So yeah, she let me paint her. I did a bunch of pregnant paintings. There's one actually that's just a close-up of her belly with the vinyl over it. Um, and there's so many option opportunities for abstraction. What I also liked about these filters was that it would obfuscate the portrait a bit. And this was a mechanism in which that people could um, see themselves. So when you look at them, because the, the, like the whole face isn't so clear, you can, you can kind of imprint your own story onto it easier. And I do get that a lot, especially with her. This is my sister-in-law in date. And she has one of these faces that um, people really see themselves a lot. I get so many comments of people saying you painted me how did you know that was you know this is me and it's my sister it's my daughter it's a, you know and so I love that to me that's that's empathy you know people are really attaching themselves to the work which I think is the magic of art is finding yourself in it um yeah I mean I can keep talking if you want but it sounds like you want to ask another question yeah I'm um I'm curious uh you know i thought for a long time that you primarily painted yourself, but as we were talking the past few days that there, you actually paint all sorts of different um, people in your life. And so I'm just curious about the process of, um, of deciding, you know, what, 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 what figure you want to paint, what person. Well, I have to know them well. I have to feel like there's some connection, emotional connection, because it is a very um, collaborative and interactive experience for me. I don't, you know, I know painters who want the model to be like a piece of meat and they don't want to know how they feel or what they're thinking. They want them to just strike the pose and treat them really objectively. Um, that's not what I'm interested in. So I, I feel like I have like a bond with the people I'm painting and I want them to reveal themselves and I want to like have this kind of conversation with them as I'm working um, because you're looking at somebody's face for a long time and it's it's impossible not to feel like you're in the room with them um, I remember painting this boyfriend I, w I had once since before that painting like 2003 or four it was and we were in a fight and I'm doing this portrait of him and it just was like this fight just kept going on and on all day long <laughs> it was awful um, 
but uh, but yeah, it is. It's a very personal experience. So I, I and then I get like a feeling from them. Like I'm, I kind of look at them and I look at their bone structure and I look at their eyes and I'm like, I think you. I just I don't know what it is, but for me, it's always intuitive. And like I said, I don't want to get, I don't want to overthink these things because when I see work that's contrived, I can feel that it's contrived in it, and I don't get to attach myself to it. And I don't want that to happen in my work. I want it to feel honest and vulnerable. So it, it's it's not that thought out. It's more impulsive than, than anything. And whatever shows up, shows up. Now I see what's here beyond the, the technical and beyond the impulse that drove me. And I'm like, oh my God, I spilled my guts in all these paintings. Excuse me. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's weird. I would love to hear um, sort of what artists or writers or um, you know uh, that that you have um, really looked up to or who have been foundational or influential in your practice, um, and how. This how? is the hard question because if I leave somebody out, I feel bad. But um, you know, in my formative years, I was obsessed with Egon Schiele, for example, the, the lines of Egon Schiele and the the vulnerability, the rawness of his work. And um, at the same time, I was obsessed with painters like Vincent Desiderio and, and Bo Bartlett and um, because of their precision and, and illusion. And the, the Vincent Desiderio for his drama, you know, like the, that's the whole reason I went to the New York Academy of Art was, was because of him and his work. And it was like, the highest possible celebrity I could meet, you know, and I don't even know if you guys even know who he is. Um, <laughs> but, um, but at the same time, there were more um, expressive painters that I really resonated with, like Jenny Saville, obviously. I mean, you probably feel her in my work. And she came to the school and taught a workshop and really, I really was influenced by her um, process. Um, and there's a lot of painters that I can talk about, um, but probably those those really got me going uh, in the beginning. And then really there was a lot of film and photography that was exciting for me as well, like Nan Golden's work and uh, Sally Mann I mentioned earlier, um, Diane Arbus, like these, these female portrait um, photographers that were capturing these very um, unposed, raw, in the moment, very uh, they felt really real, you know, real people doing real things, unapologetically, you know, not idealized. I, I found that to be very, really interesting and uh, liberating. And um, um, I also liked. I was also obsessed with David Lynch films at the time, and um, I still like him. He he wrote a book called Catching the Big Fish, which I, I really recommend. Uh, and he reads it for the audio book, which is really fun. And I, I get a lot of inspiration from him. But the weirdness of it, like the unexplainedness, where you can have some interpretation on your own, I find that to be a really important part of art, that there has to be room for the person to consume it and make sense of it. That's part of the process. I never want to reveal everything because then it's boring. Someone's like, oh, yeah, I get it. Done. Um, and the other love that I have is psychology. So there's a lot of, like, Jungian influence and and um, uh, Maslow and, um, like, other personality theories. But especially Jung and the, the, the turn of the century, uh, like, Deanna 1900 was an important period for me in terms of both art and psychology. Um, actually, in the latest pieces I, I talk about the shadow self and all of the the different personalities we've got going on inside of us I find that to be much more interesting than I did before you know in the earlier pieces it's very much about experimental technique and then you notice there's a break like the water series stops around 2012 20 yeah 2011 2012 and I pick it up again later um and I don't know if you want to talk about that, but 
um, I think well, what might be helpful is if we pick you know one piece and we sort of microscope it, and you can talk about whatever the influences or the technique or um, the sort of personal nature of the work. Um, yeah, I think we should laser focus on one piece. I think that would be helpful. Which one? Um, well, I could talk about it's all under control because that that's really closest to my personal life one right now. Directly. <laughs> Um, but, um, so in the interim of the, between 2012 to 2000, I think 2017, I kind of dabbled back in that and the, and, and then like in, during the pandemic, like in that period, I was working on landscapes, actually. Um, I abruptly stopped the water series. My, I suffered a, a major loss in my life. My mother passed away and I, very close with her and and that just changed my brain I mean I I got out of the bathroom and started to look at other people <laughs> and uh boy she uh she taught me so much and and allowing me to care for her as uh as she as she left this world and it just I so I, I ventured into a different kind of understanding about art making and it was much less solipsistic and it was much less about my own um kind of just impulsive like experiments with technique and I, I felt like I wanted to go deeper and so I kind of quit I was like this isn't working for me and I kind of quit painting and then I went out and started painting landscapes not really intending to make landscapes but just moving paint around and they kind of became landscapes and they looked a lot like something she would make she made pottery Anyway, I looked like her palette and everything. And then I, I tend to synthesize things. So I, I brought the figure back into it. And I started to work in this very psychological way where it was, it was more about human connection and it was about being part of something bigger than yourself. And, um, and then during the, the lockdown, and that went on for years. And then during the lockdown, the, the outside world felt kind of scary. So I stopped painting landscapes. I went back into this glass box and this vaporous glass box, but in a different way, in a much more abstract way where the, the figure, the portrait itself is not recognizable as a specific person at all. So these are self-portraits. That one and this one are self-portraits, but I, that actually looks a lot like my mother, especially late in her journey. Um, but they're inspired by the the feeling of, um, yeah, living in the in a world of of not being able to control anything and and really understanding that you know as much as we want to have an organized system and a recipe and a plan, um, life can just take all that away, blow it away, and so. Um, it started to be about the pandemic and the uncertainty. And, and I, I was in New York at the time, so it was pretty intense. You know, there were, I could hear race riots outside my windows and people were really, really isolated. I was completely isolated for probably a good eight months. Like my superintendent and my doorman were the only people I saw in person. And, um, and then about a year into the shutdown, my brother, who's my best friend in the world is diagnosed with brain cancer. And so it's like, again, it's just this, you know, completely out of control experience. And yet, you know, there's so many people trying to tell you like, no, no, we got this. It's going to be okay. Don't panic. Don't panic. And so that whole show I did last fall of which that was a major piece. And uh, this one here is called I Am You, and the one outside is, is uh, Be Perfectly Still. They all speak to the, the states of, like, the psychological states of how we process um, major changes, transitions in our lives, and abrupt um, circumstances that we can't control. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, the, so it, they become more emotionally driven and, and, uh, I think I'm hiding less behind a tight technique and kind of letting the paint be more painterly and really express the angst that's going on in the work, uh, which I, I 
find really satisfying. And and this painting, by the way, there's two other paintings underneath it. Like it's not under control. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of um, craziness there. And and what I loved about this image is that I I uh, I think the more you look at it, the more you really start to make sense of the expression and the the, the gripping of the hands of like this. Oh my God, you know this terror feeling. Um, and it's actually made from a video now. So I, I was um, inclined to make these little video stills and then pick out little moments from those and then kind of fuse them. And it, it allowed for a little more openness in the in the reference rather than just a still image. I actually feel like painting is a lot more like film than photography uh, in a lot of ways. You know, a photo is a, a fraction of a second. But a painting never feels like a fraction of a second. You know, if you see a photograph of somebody with their head underwater, you think, oh, they're fine. They're just there for a second. But when you see a painting of a person underwater, and I've done a few of those, it's arresting. It's frightening because you feel like there's just more time in that, in that image. So that's kind of what I, where I'm at with these, these layer pieces. I'm just going to ask one more question and then let y'all ask some questions. Um, I would love to hear some of your interests outside of painting. <laughs> We've been talking a lot about painting um, and whether you have sort of a ritual or routine around your practice that um, really serves up. Uh, I have no other interests in my life. Um, <laughs> um, no, I, um, I actually... Um, have another vocation that I I reluctantly accepted into my life, which is uh, mentoring and, and teaching. And uh, my students really created me. I didn't seek this out. I didn't think I really had much to teach. But um, I mean, much like you know, you finding my work and putting this together for me to see the meaning of it. This is what my students did. They kind of got me drunk and took me home and made me teach and. <laughs> true story and uh kind of made me realize that i have something to give and uh over the years i've done a lot of teaching technique but lately i've been mentoring a few a few people and and started to formulate um a way to bring it to larger audiences maybe through a book or and like seminars online things like that to help people to find their creative flow their their best work you know so that they can get into their, um, get on their inspiration train, you know, and, and, and figure out all of the things that tend to be in the way of that for, for people. You know, there's so many blocks that we have. There's inner critic, and then there's just, like, lack of focus and distractions and motivation and uh, worrying about what people might think and um, just, like, oh, I don't have time. All these, all these things, you know, how do you even find your ideas? And I, and I find this extreme satisfaction in helping people to find their path. Um, it's almost as good as doing it myself. Maybe even sometimes can be better, depending on the day. But it certainly um, has been an unexpected part of my journeys to realize that, you know, we can help each other get there. You know, this is not a one-sided conversation. Art making is a big conversation that we're in all together. And I wouldn't be making these paintings if I wasn't born at this time, in this uh, gender, in this part, in the part of the country that I was, to the parents I was. Like it's all so circumstantial; it's all connected. So I think the more artists can come together in a, you know, wholehearted way of, um, you know, a non-competitive way, which certainly I'm not competitive about it, and foster each other's work. So. Um, those things really interest me. And there's a, there's a lot of psychology involved in those conversations, which was a huge love of mine when I was young. And um, I actually used to think I wanted to really be a psychiatrist in, in a way. And then studying it, I realized, like, oh, my God, no. Like, I have all of these things. <laughs> all these personality disorders in me. Um, so I couldn't do that. No. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I, I figured out a way to to have the best of all worlds that way. And then the other thing I love to do is cook and bake and play music and sing and all that kind of stuff and, and cook for people and have them over 
my house and entertain them and talk about art and play board games and you know i i prefer the um to hear about it, things that inspire people and grow that as opposed to arguing or discussing um superficial things you know but uh but yeah it's it's a it's a full life i feel really lucky to be able to have all of these things going on at once well obviously we'll all be at your house next weekend yeah, <laughs> Um, so we don't have a ton of time left, but I want to leave some room for questions from you. I'm, I'm going to come up to you at the microphone because um, we're recording and I want to make sure that everybody can hear your question. So if you want to, if anybody has questions, just raise your hand and I'll walk the mic over to you. I, I really am curious about that painting in the corner. And you that you talked about both of them, but not that one. I love it. I know because I can't see it. Um it's uh but I know which one it is. It's it's scream two. And actually, um that's a recreation of a painting I made in I think two thousand ten. Um part of the shower series when I was kind of getting really immersed in the behind the sh the glass uh shower. And I made a I remade it for the set of the Americans, the T V show. <laughs> yeah did you did you see the last season oh you're gonna you're in for a treat <laughs> um they uh they were great the, it's no the whole collaboration really snowballed into you know they wanted to use a few paintings and then they wanted me to consult a little on the writing and make sure that the artist character was believable and then next thing you know i'm dressing the set and in the editing room with them and um oh it was it was such a trip it was really such a trip and like they have me you know on set and helping the artist look like she's really drawing and kind of it was great um there's a lot of synchronicities too between you know making a, a film or tv program and painting actually uh but i did a number of uh drawings for them and they did use a number of paintings but that one i actually recreated for the set uh because they i think the original Maybe it was too big or we couldn't find it. I don't remember the issue. Too big. Too big. Um, but yeah, so they, that was that was a cool thing. If you haven't seen The Americans and you want to binge watch a show, it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just comment that that painting, even within the museum staff, we had some fun discussions around it where one person perceived it as um, somebody in distress and terror um, or experiencing violence and somebody else um, thought somebody in great pleasure or joy and ecstasy and somebody else, like I, I thought that he was fogging the mirror, you know, as we do. And so, and I think that's actually something really special about Alyssa's work is that, you know, people, and this is true for, you know, art in general in many ways, that, you know, people bring their own identities and stories to the work and, um, and um, see what they're feeling in the work. So, yeah. uh, any other questions? It's not really a question, but I wanted to have a chance to make a quick comment. And that I've seen a lot of your work in reproduction online. None of it prepared me for the experience of being with it in person. Um, it's very moving the content and the way you've approached it. And also thank you for coming because it's been wonderful listening to you talk about the work. Thank you so much. I, I love hearing all of that. That's That means a lot to me. And it's a pleasure to be here. Else have questions? Mine is pretty straightforward. Is that what age did you begin to become an artist? I'm still working on it. Um, in my head, uh, I you know I I started my first oil painting class when I was eight. Uh, my teachers saw I could color in the lines pretty good, I guess, and told my mom to send me to a painting class, which she took very literally and sent me to an adult painting class. I was the youngest person by decades. But when I went into that uh, that room and smelled the linseed oil, I was I was home, um, and I just kept it up, you know. And I think during my 
my my angsty young teenage years. It was really a life raft. Um, again, with a large family, a lot of testosterone uh, there, um, I found a lot of uh, relief and peace in my own space. And I could paint a, like a, a world that was my own. And it was the one thing my brothers didn't uh, take away and break or whatever. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I, I really relied on it and I kind of found my, my niche, my thing. So it was, it became an identity and I just clung to it. So it was a no brainer. Like this is what I was going to do. And it, I didn't think too hard about it in college and graduate school. It was just like, what's the next step? I didn't, I never questioned it. Um, which was which is probably pretty scary for my parents, I think. They were like, you need to get a real job. You're not going to make a living off of this. And I was like, yeah, I'll work at Starbucks. What? Um, there wasn't a Starbucks then. But uh, no, I sincerely just planned, like, you know, I'll be an administrative assistant. I'll work at a, as a waitress. I don't really care, but I have to paint. And uh, I I fully intended to, to have that life. I, I just wanted to to paint and I didn't overthink it. So I, I think I always had that, um, idea, but I, I don't think I ever really felt like I am an artist. That still feels strange to call myself that. I think of myself as a painter, um, a person, you know, but I, I, I think that's a big title and I'm just kind of figuring it out. I'm experimenting, you know, said about thanking you for being here. And um, I don't really have a question, but there's a couple of things that really stood out to me. One is thank you for the mentoring and that you've made that important in your life because I feel that artists are so vulnerable, especially when they're forming themselves. I mean, yes, they're constantly forming themselves, um, but to be able to have someone like you said, you amplify their inspiration rather than the other way around and that this really moves me so thanks for, for sharing that and bringing it to this conversation and also i'm thinking about the difference and maybe you could speak to this a little bit between the paintings where the body is in water versus the body that is in has water but there is a man-made material separating the body in water from the viewer and um, it has a very different impact for me, those, because the body is made up of so much water and then it's submerged in water. So in a sense, there's no separation, but then you add like the ones that were painted during the pandemic, where there is definitely a man-made created obstacle there. And if that is intentional, if it was something you noticed afterwards when you followed that inspiration, whatever that's an interesting question um i i have to say that it was the glass door that was the final frontier for the water series that's where i landed after all these experiments you know and you know that i didn't talk about charade that was that was like probably the most immersive into the water where i, I actually put flour in the bathtub to make it foggy and then i put cooking oil on the top of the I I don't know where this stuff comes from, but I, I was like, I wonder what that would look like. So I did it, and then I shined all these lights on it, and it just it looked so interesting. And stuck a girl in there, painted her, and um, and it was an experiment. But then I got to the glass doors, and it was actually Vincent who saw the body of work I I had made at that point, and there was one behind the glass door, and he said, "This is your best painting," and I trust him, and I was like, I don't know what the deal is but I decided to make more of those and and explore those and I found that it gave me a lot to work with because um yeah there is a there's I mean an art therapist could have a field day with what this barrier means and and then an uh, an art critic could talk about like okay this is the fourth wall and you know all, all this kind of to me that wasn't what it was about 
to me, it was about a, a solution between merging this idea of, of abstraction, of, of Dionysian, of, of emotion, nonlinear um, thought with the Apollonian and the logical and the linear. And it, it, it just gave me so much room because of the steam distorting everything and the pressing of the skin distorting. And then sometimes I would have textured glass that would do even more. So, and then these drops of water that come in like little jewels, it gave me so much to play with that um, it was a visual field day. And that, from, that was where I was coming from with it. It actually allowed me to um, jump off of the literal thing I was painting into just creating a language. You know what I mean? So now it's, it doesn't need to be a glass barrier with literal water and a literal person's portrait and steam and all of these knowable uh, elements. So in these later paintings, it just becomes this imagery. So the, the, the glass was actually the open door to... <laughs> To, uh, to doing what I always wanted to do. Like all of the experiment kind of led to that. You know, just painting. Yeah. Time for just a couple more questions. Uh, this is my favorite part. I, I love the question part. So I was just interested in your, how you got from painting to photography and then back to painting that process because, I mean, I'm older, obviously, than I studied it years and years ago, and I thought, you know, photography is that many stories of painting, and then it sort of merged together. So I'm not familiar with, if someone was going to mention, for example, Vincent, I don't know who that is. He's a contemporary painter, I'm certain. Okay. How did you um, just talk a little bit about your feelings about that? I'm well aware of the stigma. Yeah. Yeah, that's what my next sentence is. I, I'm well aware of the stigma and I don't care. I've actually um, been teaching a workshop called, you know, uh, Transcending the Photo Reference and kind of outing myself and everybody else who works from, who paints from photographs because so many painters do. Um, you know, the dawn of photography almost put painters out of a job. It was like, you know, it was really a, a scary thing for portrait painters specifically, but it didn't work. There was still something about painting that people wanted instead of a photograph. And I think photography went off and did its own thing too. Um, I've just been attracted to both and I want to use both. Um, I wouldn't ever show my photographs as finished works of art, though. I've never done that. I don't think I ever would. And I should say, every time I say never, right? The, yes, you, there is a ton of them, but I don't think it would be interesting. They're so awful. I mean, it's it's just like like the they really don't look good. <laughs> they would look like uh, I don't know how to describe it. It's just it's a mess. It's a mess. Your next major retrospective, maybe there'll be photos too. I think it would be disappointing. I think it would be um, sad for the photos. You know, I, I think that's what it is. It's like the photos really are so disappointing. Whereas, like, when you look at a series of drawings that are made, like, I just came back from Vienna where I saw, uh, like, just like 500 uh, Klimt drawings that are on display now um, uh, for the Beethoven frieze, which he painted. And I, and I find these drawings to be maybe one of the most amazing pieces of art I've seen in my whole life. They're just so moving. They're so raw. The photographs don't feel like that. Like they, they feel very um, much a means to an end for me. Uh, I don't think they stand on their own. I think it would be they would just gum up the whole thing and and no, I, I don't think they have a place in an exhibition space. Um, it's kind of more my my personal process that 
I don't think is that interesting. I don't know. Maybe I'll change my mind, but at the moment, I don't. I don't think so. And I don't like the idea of the of people going. Well, this part is in the photo. Let's compare it to the painting. Let's see that. I think that that's not good for any. I don't think that that's a useful thing because it's it's not about just how it's made. It's about the why. And if we get too mired in the weeds with the technique, you miss the most important part. You know. So. I get that people want to see how it's done, but that's not really how it's done. You know, because I, I've seen many people copy photographs, and there are people who do an amazing job at it. They've got these magnifying things and these brushes that have like one hair, and they can copy photographs. And I think that's great for them. Um, but to me, that doesn't, it doesn't let me paint. You know, and, and the photograph is really just a, a reason to paint for me. So it, it's different than, uh, I don't know, it's an important part, but it's not a finished product in itself. Does that answer the question? I did. I I did have some fun with that, and um, I enjoyed it. But I I never felt the need to, uh, to like make it a finished thing. I I always felt the impulse to try to paint it. To me, that was always the thing. It was so. Now let's see what paint can do. So I I don't know. It was always a vehicle to the paint. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more question. So make it a great one. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you're saying. I'm super curious about, um, you've told us about the videotaping and the picture taping and then your process of arriving at your product. I'm curious about how you work through the preliminary stages to get to the point of the painting so that we see the liveness of the paint. Like, can you give some examples of how are you playing with the paint and creating pre-paintings or sketches to bring yeah. your idea to fruition? Yeah, I like this. This is a great question. Thank you. Um, I love talking about paint. <laughs> so I tried a bunch of things um, it, to, to do exactly what you said, is make the paint come alive and, and create different ways of using the paint. and. Um, it is always, I always try to do something a little different. Um, but I will most of the time mix a lot of paint out. That's a, that's a given. I want to have a lot of paint ready to go. I don't want to have to stop and like try to stretch one color as long as possible. I need to have all the paint I need at the ready. So that's always a, a, a thing. Um, but when I start, I've done things like I will just work off a grid with no image. And just make marks to to start, like with never any silhouette whatsoever. Uh, that that causes me to really arrive and be really attentive to the volumes and the form, because the contour is the very last thing that will appear. Um, and it becomes very much about the sculptural, the um, the color relationships that create the volume as opposed to the drawing or the silhouette. I think immersion was one of those where I actually started with a knife and just big pieces. But yeah, Vaseline, sorry, immersion was that one. Um, and it was very much about building color relationships to find a form and then kind of knitting it together in a way. Um, if I've done drawings underneath, like I, I would tend to use an underpainting that's very, um, like an opposite color. So if like it's a cool painting, I'll use a really warm wash underneath so that wash can kind of peek through and vibrate. You can really see it in this one. Um, it's like a really warm orange underneath that, that turquoise. Um, so that really makes the paint come alive, the layering. Um, I will... Some, sometimes I would intentionally paint the painting way too dark 
so that I could build up transparent layers of light over top because that will give a luminescence. Um, so, but I do. I don't always do this the same way. It's that then it would get boring. I don't want to have a system. I'm way too restless for that. Um, something else I might do, like if I do create a drawing for some of the more complicated, like uh, these landscape people, I would have to have some concept of where things are, and I would, I would make these like little islands of forms but they would be loose enough that it would just give me a little to be like okay this is where I'm headed but I I don't ever never ever 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 do I go through and make like a really tight drawing underneath the painting because to me that is that's like a cage you know and I need to ironically go outside the lines so the thing that got me into art school to begin with is staying in the lines now I absolutely can't have lines because they will, they'll limit the form, they limit the, the life. And, you know, I'm constantly dissuading students from making these outlines right away because, first of all, your outline's never going to be right on the first shot. You've got to see where it ends up. So I'm very, um, I try to be as minimal as I can with an underpainting and intentionally wrong, you know, a little bit so that there's something to figure out. I, I really like puzzles and trying to put things together and and to me that's what brings the life into it you know when you know exactly where you're going you can just fall asleep you can put it on autopilot it's kind of like when you take a trip to a foreign country and you've got it all itinerary like planned out to the t like you may as well not even take the trip you may as well not but if you have these surprise experiences where like all of a sudden you're in like a little teeny town outside the city and you're in someone's house and they're cooking you a homemade meal and there's their cat and you're like now you're a part of their family like it's like oh my god I had a real experience in this foreign land that doesn't happen because you plan that happens because you don't and that's that has to be part of the process to, to create that life that you're talking about so whatever I can do to make room for that <laughs> Fine. <laughs> Look at that face. I love that answer about travel, and you were right on the money. But I'm curious. I didn't get to go to art school, and I wanted to because I had to make a living. So um, what did you take away at eight from art school that is still with you, possibly? At eight years old? Yeah. That was a real wonderful experience i'm hoping or was it no it, it was great you know it's, it was funny because my teacher would paint on the paintings and uh and i actually learned really well from watching somebody paint even watching vince paint was one of the most informative things in graduate school but this teacher would paint on my paintings and then i'd go home with these paintings that look like i mean eight years old and they're like these masterpieces and i could you imagine my parents just being like uh this kid is a genius. And then they figured it out. And they told the teacher to stop doing that. And then, of course, you know, the truth comes out and it's like these silly little kid paintings. Um, what I gleaned from that probably was just that this was my home. This is, I, I loved it. I, you know, this was like kind of my language. Uh, so that's the most important thing. Technically, I can't tell you, you know, but I think it was being familiar with the materials. You know, learning anything is understanding your medium. You know, when you get a new instrument, like a, a musical instrument, the best thing you can do is just sit there and play with it. See what it does, see what it does, see what it does. And, and, and you create questions in your mind. Then you go and ask those questions. It's kind of like that. Like if you just are told, okay, here's what you have to do, it's very hard to be interested because you haven't created your own questions yet. You know, so by the time I got to graduate school, I had taken a bunch of classes and learned nothing of substance, but I had all this experience with paint that gave me a lot of questions. You know, so it was the exposure. I love that. Thank you, Alyssa, so much for the generosity. Thank you, Emma. I thank all of you.